Having to use multiple development stacks, cloud providers, or operating systems is normal and quite common if you work on a lot of diverse projects. But switching from Node.js to Python, Azure to AWS, Windows to Mac puts a cognitive load on your brain, preventing you from putting 100% of your effort into solving the problem at hand. It's easy to develop muscle memory for a few simple things like control versus command in Windows and Mac, but with many variations of languages and frameworks, operating systems, and things like that, the key to being productive as a software engineer is to set up your development environment across all your devices to be as similar as possible. That takes away the cognitive load of switching context off your mind and lets you instead focus on solving the actual problem. I've just gotten an M1 MacBook Pro, so I thought it'd be a great time to show you how I set up my laptop from scratch to make sure my development environment stays as consistent across platforms as possible. Even though this example is for my Mac, my setup in Windows is almost identical. I'll try to make note of any differences between the operating systems as I go. Hi guys, my name is Utsav and I'm a software engineer based in Seattle, Washington. And this channel is all about helping you excel in your software engineering careers. So if you're into that, please consider subscribing. As usual, all the reference materials from this video will be in the description below and I have timestamps, so feel free to jump to the sections that interest you more. All right, let's get started. But before I get to installing all the development goodness, there are a few settings I change, some apps I install and uninstall to make the system more consistent across my environments. I almost exclusively use my keyboard, so I like to remove all the things that are designed to be used with a mouse or trackpad and take up unnecessary space. So the first thing I change is the dock. I never really use the dock, so I remove all the icons from it and set it to the smallest size possible and auto hide it. I used to hide it at the bottom of the screen, but sometimes if you have to do some horizontal scrolling, it gets in the way. So I just like to put it on the left here and never use it. Um, so now it's out of sight and out of mind and you get some extra useful real estate. And this is even more useful if you're on a smaller Mac, like a 13 inch. Uh, the next step is Finder. Uh, it's also full of crap that no one needs, so I'll clean it up a bit and make sure that it only has things that I use. I also enable some extra status bars and information that I find useful. This step is basically to make Explorer and Finder similar with the same information and quick links between Windows and Mac. Okay, once I'm done with the Finder, I just disable Spotlight. Um, it's a bit slow and doesn't really find relevant stuff very well. It supports Apple's idea of what the user wants to find versus what my idea is that I want to find. So I feel like it doesn't really work well for me. Um, I'll replace it with something else later in this video. All right, now the system is decluttered. We can move on to installing a package manager for the system. And my choice here is Brew or Homebrew. This makes it really easy to install packages from the command line instead of having to go to websites and click and download the various packages and things like that. Um, for Windows, you can either use PowerShell or Chocolatey to achieve similar results. All right, once the package manager is installed, I install a few apps that make my life easier first before I move on to the dev stuff. I'm not a fan of Safari, so the first app I'll install is a browser. Uh, my browser of choice is Edge, but you can use whatever you fancy. Uh, all of those should be available as um, formulas in Brew. So the next thing to do is to replace the default terminal with iTerm2. Um, I think the main reason I install this is because I've been using it for the longest time, so I'm just used to it. But it's very customizable, and one cool thing with iTerm2 is that it allows you to click links. So a lot of time, if you've worked on coding, you have build errors and documentations and stuff that appear in the console logs and things like that. And it's really annoying to have to copy that and paste it in the browser. Uh, with, but with iTerm, you can just click them and it's all good. On Windows, I use ConEmu, which is short for console emulator, uh, as my terminal of choice. And I think um, Windows Power Tools version is also quite well, as some viewers have pointed out to me, but I'm just used to console emulator. The next app I install is Alfred. This is like Spotlight that we disabled earlier, but it's way faster and much more relevant. And it's also more customizable. You can hook it up with search engines and things like that, create custom events or create commands for any frequently used shortcuts and things like that. So it's really powerful. And 
once I've installed Alfred, I'm going to link it up with the default command space shortcuts so that instead of Spotlight, which we disabled earlier, we pop up Alfred instead. All right. The last one here is Spotify, obviously. Uh, I listen to a lot of music and I don't think I'm ever coding or doing anything without some music in the background. So I just install Spotify. All right. So let's move on to the <laughs> engineering stuff now. So I install a few different things because I tend to work with a lot of different types of stacks or frameworks, if you may. Um, I tend to work with Node, Python, and .NET very frequently. So I'm going to install things around those toolings or, or those frameworks. So the first thing, regardless of what stack you use, is Git. Um, so you likely use it. So I'll install that as the very first thing. OK, once Git is installed, I install Node Version Manager. This lets me easily manage different versions of Node. Um, doing that from their website is pretty much a big headache. Um, and then if you've worked on Node projects, different Node projects will require different versions. Sometimes there's like breaking dependencies. And, and if you don't manage that well, it's, it's, it causes a lot of issues. So this helps solve the problem. Think of it like almost like a virtual environment for Python. Uh, so it just manages versions inside its own sandbox and it's easy to use. Speaking of Python, the next thing I install is Python and virtual environment. So basically they're the same as Node and NVM. The next thing I install is .NET Core. I use a lot of things on .NET and .NET Core has come a long way, cross-platform, so it's easy to work with. So that's what I install. And finally, I install Azure SDK and CLI. Um, I use a lot of cloud services and most of the time I'm using Azure. So these make my life a lot easier. Now that everything's configured, the last thing to do is install and configure VS Code. On Windows, I'll also install Visual Studio. I also have a full video on how I set up my VS Code, so I'm not gonna go through all the extensions here, but I'll quickly run through that. So I've got a list of extensions I use. Um, and if you have sync enabled, it's super easy to get them synced up. So as you can see, Visual Studio code is installed. All I have to do is really go in and log in and you will start seeing all the extensions pop up and you really don't have to do anything. Um, if you don't like logging in or sharing your profile across the cloud, then you can set up a simple text file with all your extension names, um, their official names, and use a simple script that you run after you install VS Code that simply goes and installs the extensions um, for you. So you can do that as well. Like I said in the beginning of the video, the idea is to have your setup across stacks and operating systems as similar as possible to take the cognitive load of context switching off your mind, right? And one of the main things that acts as a barrier when switching frequently is APIs, conventions, syntaxes, and different kinds of things. And one extension out of this list that has helped me the most in avoiding that is Tab9, who've also kindly sponsored this video. Tab9 is the world's leading AI code completion tool, trusted by over a million developers worldwide. Tab9 supports nearly all modern languages and also understands what language the developer is working on. So if you switch stacks frequently like me, something like Tab9 will help you stay more productive. Tab9 helps you code faster, reduce mistakes, and discover best coding practices using machine learning models that use over 380 million parameters, constantly learning from public code repositories to suggest the right code completion for you at the right time. It's based on OpenAI's GPT-2 model, and since the model is textual, it can also complete and understand natural language like to do comments as well. And the best part, it's free to get started. And you can always upgrade to the pro plan, which is GPU powered for advanced completion models, as well as personalized completion models that you can train on specific code of your choosing. You also have the option to choose to run the completion models locally on your machine or use cloud completions where your code is encrypted on its way out and then immediately deleted. So if you want to try Tab9, the first 100 users to use the promo code Utsav Pro will get 50% off their Tab9 Pro subscription. Link will be in the description below. Okay, so the last thing to do is make sure everything is syncing. All your profiles in VS Code, iCloud, OneDrive, whatever tools you use. Setting that up properly makes sure development is much more hassle-free. But since that's very individual to the tools you use, I'm going to skip showing that in this video. And finally, since most of this is used using an app installer, you can easily automate this whole setup using dot files or some of your own custom scripts and push it up to your own repo in GitHub and always keep that script 
up to date. That way, all you have to do when setting up a new system is just pull that script and run that one script and it will set up your entire system. I used to have one made for Chocolatey on Windows when I used to try a lot of early release version of Windows that crashed a lot and forced me to reset up my machine frequently. But these days, everything is so stable and I really don't have to set up my machines frequently enough to warrant the extra effort of creating something like that. But just wanted to share in case you guys wanted to do it. Well, that's all for this video. Let me know in the comments below how you set up your machine for development and if you have any tips and tricks that can improve my workflow as well. Uh, as always, if you enjoyed this video, please like it, comment on it and share it. And while you're here, please subscribe for more content like this. I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.